Hi everyone, welcome to chapter three. We will now talk about prenatal periods of development and teratogens. So we're almost to our first age group, but we have to cover these initial chapters of how we get to being in our first period of infancy. All right, make sure, there we go. Okay, so what's going on just in general, right? Women, as soon as they reach puberty, uh, in the middle of their menstrual cycle, which is typically about every 28 days, but for some women, it could be 35 days to 45 days. Um, but what's typically happening is one egg is released into the fallopian tubes every menstrual cycle. Now I have the word hyperovulation listed because some women drop more than one egg. And again, it's just part of our genetics and how things happen. Um, and again, that could lead to fraternal twins, right? Identical twins is one egg and one sperm that splits, whereas fraternal twins is due to hyperovulation. More than one egg was dropped at the same time, and they were both, or more than two, were fertilized. Now, every month, a woman's body is preparing itself for pregnancy. And once it realizes that it's not pregnant is when it sheds the uterine lining. So again, some women do get a lot of hormones and pain and things that come with that because, again, it's this process of kind of shedding and starting over every month. Now, men are developing millions of sperm uh, per day when they are released. About 300 to 500 of them can reach the egg and they can live for up to six days. <clears throat> so they do think conception happens within typically a three-day period, but could be up to six days. And once that egg and that sperm unite, then we have the beginning of prenatal development. So if you're looking at a previous version of our textbook, they referred to the first period as the zygote period because the organism is a zygote at that point. But now they're referring it to it as the germinal period, followed by the period of the embryo or the embryonic period, and lastly is the fetal period. Now, as we go in order of each of these periods, they increase in length. Each one is longer than the next, and each one is very important for their job in the prenatal development process. Okay. So the germinal period is the first about two weeks of pregnancy, when many women don't even know they're pregnant, right? A two-week period is a very short amount of time. Now this zygote, again, the egg and the sperm united have now become a zygote, it begins to duplicate, it begins to divide within hours of conception. It's pretty amazing how quickly this process starts. By they think about the fourth day, it's considered a blastocyst, which is a fluid-filled ball, kind of what you see the picture there on the left. And then its job in, the, in these two weeks is to implant itself. And again, usually around 10 days after conception, it's creating its home. And that's what I think about is, first, it needs to establish the environment that it's going to grow in for you know the next nine months. So it implants itself into the uterine lining of the mother and starts to you know form its way of getting nutrients and its survival now the amnion encloses the organism directly and then that amniotic fluid where all of that um, duplication is going on with our cells uh, moderates not only the temperature but also provides this kind of gravityless uh, cushioning for the organism so that it's steady comfortable and ready to grow for the next nine months. Okay, so if we look at this picture here, as we know the journey of the sperm, they go through the vagina, through the cervix, through the uterus, and all the way through the fallopian tube to meet the egg uh, when it's ovulating, you know, from the ovary. So think about it, why do you think the sperm has such a long journey? Why couldn't the egg just come down the fallopian tube and meet the sperm halfway? Well, they say the fittest sperm, the most healthy, uh, the strongest, sorry, 
my dog started to bark, so I had to pause it. But the strongest sperm are the ones who can travel the furthest. So it's kind of the body's way of getting that strongest sperm to meet the egg and hopefully develop the, the most healthy organism. So if we look here, you see that zygote starts to travel through the fallopian tube. And if it gets stuck there for any reason, that's called an eptopic pregnancy and has to be terminated because an organism is not able to grow in that tube. Now, it becomes a blastocyst. Again, it's starting to divide and develop. And then it implants itself, number three here, right in that uterine lining of the mother and starts to form their connection. So what is going on in this second week? So once it implants itself, it has these things that are developing, chorion, placenta, umbilical cord. So this picture kind of shows it. I know it's showing an embryo, which is the next um, period, but I could just kind of want to show you here. So there's the amnion, kind of the pink area that surrounds the organism. Outside the amnion is the chorion, and that starts to connect to the placenta. The placenta is connected to the uterus, and that umbilical cord is actually what connects the mother and the placenta to the organism. Okay, let me jump back now. So again, the placenta is developing from the chorion. The placenta allows not only food and oxygen to come in and reach that developing or organism, but it also carries away the waste from the embryo. And the placenta is a filtration system. It does prevent the mother and, and the organism's blood from mixing. I don't know if you've ever thought about it or know your blood type, but you're not necessarily the same blood type as your mother. So the placenta has to filter out the blood so that it's not mixing and causing the organism to be unhealthy or the mother but it can't filter everything. So we're gonna talk about teratogens at the end of this chapter. Now, the umbilical cord, again, is the cord that connects the organism to the placenta, which is connected to the mother in the uterus. Now, this is just, again, a little more information, kind of reiterating what we already saw. Okay. So now that zygote is becoming an embryo in about the third week into about the end of the eighth week or the second month of pregnancy. So what's being developed? Well, if the last period was the period of establishing the environment, the nutrients, the home, I would say this period is the period of laying down the foundation, laying down all the body parts that we need to become a human. So I have listed here the central nervous system, the organs, the muscles, the skeleton, the heart, our neurons in our brain, our facial features, our extremities. Again, everything we need that makes us a human. So this period especially is very susceptible to teratogens, which we're going to talk about like alcohol and tobacco. It can cause structural abnormalities in a human if it's ingested during this time. So again, if I were to think about what's the most important thing going on during this period, the foundations being laid out, the blueprint of what we are going to become. And if you look at this picture here, you can tell that that's at some point going to become a human. Right now, it's an embryo. It's a developing organism, but it's starting to form its shape. Now the fetal period, so the first germinal period was two weeks, the embryonic period was about six weeks, and now the fetal period is about seven months, a long time, right? So this is our longest prenatal period, and really what's happening during this period is the organism is starting to become stronger, growing, becoming organized and connected, so there's three actual um, trimesters, which I'm sure you've heard of. The first trimester is from conception to about three months. Second trimester is about three to four months to six months. And the third trimester is about seven months to the end of pregnancy. So think about it. When does the germinal period happen? Which trimester? The first, right? It's the first two weeks. It's happening during the first trimester. When does the embryonic period happen? 
during the first trimester. When does the fetal period begin during the first trimester? Well, all the periods are happening at some point during the first trimester, which shows you why it makes sense that some women have a lot of sickness in that first trimester because so much change is going on to their body. Many times it'll kind of smooth out and they'll become less sick. Some women are sick the whole time. Some women aren't sick at all. The joys of the human body, right? We all handle things differently. Okay, so a little bit more about the fetus here. Again, in that third month, it starts to become organized. Uh, the heartbeat was beating alone. You know, everything was kind of working on its own. And now it's going to start to try to make those connections to be um, controlled by the brain. So during the second trimester, the, the organism is actually preparing itself for the birthing process. So the age of viability, they believe the earliest chance an organism can be born and survive is sometime between 22 to 26 weeks. Now, that's kind of the end of the sixth month into the second month, seventh month. Um, but again, that's early on in your pregnancy. If a full-term pregnancy is, let's say, 40 weeks, 38 to 42 weeks, that's only halfway. About 22 weeks is halfway through pregnancy. So again, shows you why that's the earliest chance of survival. It does not necessarily mean that an organism will be born during that time and actually survive. So um, the organism, again, is preparing itself. It starts to develop vernix, which is this white kind of like chapstick all over their body. And lanugo grows through that like a white downy hair, which helps the vernix stick and makes, again, going through the birthing canal a little bit easier on the organism. So look at what's happening during the seventh um, to ninth month, again, depending on when this organism is born everything is starting to mature. The lungs, the heart, again, extensive growth is going on. Personality and preference is starting to develop. This organism is getting ready to join the outside world, right? So a lot of maturing and um, kind of organization is happening in that third trimester. Okay. So I have videos on Blackboard. Please follow up and get some more detail about what's going on in the womb. And here's teratogens. So what is a teratogen? It's any environmental agent that can cause damage during the prenatal periods. Again, whether it is purposeful or unintentional, but the damage depends on the dose that has been uh, consumed. If there's already hereditary um, susceptibility to that teratogen, if there's multiple teratogens or other things going on maybe with the mother, and even the age of the mother plays into how the organism will be affected. Most commonly, it's psychological and physical consequences for that organism, for that child, once they're born. Okay, so there's many teratogens. I'm trying to change my slide here. Um, well, actually, first let's look at this chart. I mentioned earlier that the embryonic period is the period where we're the most susceptible to teratogen damage. And again, as you can see, that's when the structures are being put in place. Usually, the first two weeks we're not susceptible to teratogens, but in extreme cases, again, a pregnancy can be lost, especially if there's drug use or other things involved. Now, the fetal period, even if you're consuming something or exposed to something, the earlier you stop, the better, because that brain is becoming fully developed in that fetal period. So there can be lots of psychological uh, issues if that teratogen continues throughout the fetal period. So there are many types of teratogens. There's prescription and non-prescription drugs. There's legal and illegal drugs, tobacco, alcohol, things in the environment like radiation or other environmental pollution. Or what about the mother? What if she has a maternal disease or there's maternal stress? So as a non-prescription drug here, I highlighted caffeine. 
it's found in coffee, you know, teas, uh, sodas, even chocolate. But what they find is, again, depending on the mother, depending on the organism, how much is consumed, how often, uh, the child may be born with low birth weight. And we'll talk in chapter four more about what are the consequences of low birth weight, how does that relate to prematurity, and all of that. Now, what about illegal drugs, right? We have legal drugs now, like marijuana, right? It's not illegal everywhere. It is associated in many times with poor outcomes for the child when they're actually um, in middle childhood or adolescence. It's not seen typically in those first few years, but they have seen effect. Cocaine, heroin, methadone, again, all of those lead to a variety of issues for a child once they're born. Now, tobacco is something we always hear about, right? Children being born, um, having been exposed to tobacco from their mothers or even just being around secondhand smoke, right? That can cause not only low birth weight, but even miscarriage, other issues with prematurity, uh, developmental issues like a cleft lip uh, and palate, which again, you've probably seen that, that groove in the lip before. It could even lead to infant death or later issues with cancer or asthma for that child. Again, something that was exposed to them in the womb before they were even born. Now, with alcohol, you might have heard of fetal alcohol syndrome. Well, there's actually a spectrum. Uh, there's a variety of diagnoses depending on how that child is affected. So they have fetal alcohol syndrome, which is the worst, partial fetal alcohol syndrome, and alcohol-related neural developmental disorder, or ARND. So here's the criteria. They either have slow physical growth, facial abnormalities, or some type of brain injury. So you see with fetal alcohol syndrome, they have all of them. But with ARND, they may only have um, maybe some issues with attention or focusing or, you know, things like that. So that's fetal alcohol syndrome. Now, environmental pollution, they say there's more than 75,000 chemicals that we use in the U.S. So we're born now polluted. We're exposed to these things, and it's very difficult, again, to kind of stay away. Well, what that leads to, again, can be physical and mental issues and life-threatening issues later on. So things like mercury, they you know, advise pregnant women to stay away from predatory fish because many times those carry mercury. And that can lead to, as you see here, serious issues with a, an infant when they're born. What about lead? That's many times in, in paint. I had to sign a lease a few years ago when I lived in a home stating that I knew that the house was painted in lead paint because, again, it was an old home. Well, again, if you're pregnant or exposed to fumes, that can lead to severe issues with uh, our infants. Now, lead can again affect children in so many ways, from the brain to hormones to the stomach to even reproductive issues to the bones, right? So <clears throat> you can kind of look through here and see all the many issues that might develop. Now, on Blackboard, I have some videos there I'd like you guys to watch, just some short video clips, but I'm sure you remember a few years ago where they changed the water supply in Flint, Michigan, and it led to extreme issues of lead in the water, which poisoned not only pregnant mothers, their infants, children, and led to very, you know, severe outcomes for these people, and now they don't even have the resources in place to protect them. So please watch these videos on Blackboard uh, to really highlight how lead can affect not just children, developing organisms, and families. Now, I was talking about things like maternal disease. What if a mom has a cold or the flu? Typically, no impact. But we're seeing now with things like coronavirus, it does have an impact. So, you know, those are things where we have to closely work with the doctor. Rubella, the MMR vaccination, measles, mumps, and rubella. So that's why, because look at all of those severe outcomes. Um, AIDS is many times passed to babies, so it has to be, um, you know, medically supervised. HIV mothers, 20 to 30 percent of them can pass the virus, 
And again, many times prenatal babies, especially with AIDS, cannot survive uh, very long past their birth. You may have heard of things like toxoplasmosis. Uh, they say pregnant women should stay away from the kitty litter. Again, it can lead to very severe outcomes for their baby. What about the Zika virus, right? That was something we heard a few years ago where these mothers who were pregnant were getting infected with the virus and it was leading to microcephaly in infants. Their babies were being born with heads that were a lot smaller than compared to other typically developing children. This actually affects 25 children in the U.S. every year, but this was such an extreme amount. We were seeing it happen in such large numbers that it was a you know national emergency. They put barriers to travel, so I have videos about this on Blackboard also. Now, what about stress? Stress, again, is something that can cross the placenta, they believe. It's not filtered, so it can raise heart rates. It can cause, you know, changes in uh, the organism's behavior. Um, it can predict outcomes in the child later of having anxiety or issues with attention. And they do find if mothers have support, those stress uh, hormones that are being released can actually reduce and lead to better outcomes for the child when they're born. Prenatal health care is really important. Things can happen that maybe weren't an issue before, like gestational diabetes, developing issues with sugar that maybe was never an issue before, or preeclampsia, or what's called toxemia, where the mother may have an increase in her blood pressure, and that could lead to her convulsing, maybe dying, or leading to the organism not surviving. Now, there's many reasons why we delay prenatal care, having, you know, financial hardships, trying to keep it a secret. Um, you know, again, there's many issues. Well, what they find is across um, race and age, there's many reasons, but we find that adolescents are the most common to not seek prenatal care, again, maybe due to secrecy reasons. All right, that's the end of this chapter. Please, as always, email me with any questions.